this is what it would have sort of looked like to European um, artists. And you can see that the city was much bigger than it is today. So the city walls on the Mediterranean Sea and all around the city, several forts, buildings outside the city. Um, the forts, most of which have been also destroyed um, by the French authorities. This is another map in 1804. Uh, so quite shortly before the French invasion. And we can see, we can have a better idea of the townscape of Algiers at that time. That's an important point that um, I'll be talking about. We can appreciate better the height of the city walls, the agglomeration of the houses and the different buildings and the extensions north and south of the city on the right and on the left of the image, which might have indicated actually a rise in the population at the time. And finally, well, this is one of the first precise mapping of the city before any French colonial destruction. So this is really 1830, the start of the occupation. And on technical terms, everything that survives from this is uh, the Casbah. So the first uh, sort of problem that occurs with the Caspa is the destructions that it has um, that it has experienced at the start of the colonization. This is the an example of such a destruction, the Al Sayida Mosque in the eight, 1831. Um, it's one of the tens of mosques and buildings, really, and houses that were um, compulsorily purchased and destroyed. And um, I mean, you have to understand that these destructions have also taken part because of ideological considerations. Um, Islam as a religion or as a civilization was sort of antagonized by the French colonial rationale. And the Islamic architecture of Algiers as a product of that was therefore seen as primitive, vile, or uh, even ugly, and was therefore to be destroyed, replaced, or hidden. Um, and we can see the result of such a um, policy. So it was replaced by what the French themselves saw as architecture, it's more fitting buildings, um, that is to say, uh, neoclassical productions. Um, this is the eastern part of the historic city and the only buildings that survive here are really the mosques that you can see, um, next to the Chamber of Commerce, which, are, which is also a colonial building. Um, the very much tall colonial buildings that you can see here were used to hide um, the caspa. And this will have resulted in a ghettoization of the caspa. So it was transformed slowly into a ghetto, um, which will further create a sort of, of social isolation and cause a sort of slow process of decay that's going to uh, happen. And we can see that today in the present state of the caspa. So this is a satellite image and you can see the differences between really three, um, three types of urban fabric. So the cast by itself is on the left and you can see those sort of organic um, urban fabric. On the southeast, you can see a geometrical urbanism that is French colonial productions. And on the very east, you've got um, sort of modern spread out um, developments and all of these different uh, fabrics are cohabiting with each other. On this map now, you can see the condition of the Caspa. So what's colored in gray is buildings that are originally before, uh, dating from before 1830. What is colored in white is French built and what's colored in black are either, are either um, houses in ruin or just urban empty spaces. And you can see that, um, I mean, I hope you can appreciate how much it's, it's actually left in terms of uh, original buildings. And that's unfortunately not very, not very much. And this is what it looks like when you go on site. So it's not a very good um, condition by some, uh, in some places. Uh, this is the interior of a house, the, the middle image is an interior of a house and this is unfortunately um, not a sort of isolated case. There are a few more images of such um, destructions that you can appreciate. Um, now, the Caspa is not just a dramatic and tragic story. There is uh, some form of uh, successful conservation of it, as you can see in these images. Um, however, uh, as you can see, 
what what represents the the good sides of conservation of the Casper is um, what the Casper shows us as uh, urban and architectural characteristics. So these narrow streets, which are really lively, full of people, where society and um, is is really taking in place, where people are are playing a role, and this is partly uh, a success in some places of the city. Very good. Uh, this is um, a picture that really summarizes the case of Algiers, of the Algiers Caspa, um, partly destroyed and partly still there. So it's really a, a heritage site that's partially lost. Now it's importance. The importance of the Caspa comes from the fact that it's a particular case of um, Islamic urbanism and architecture. So it has different influences. Um, it's got Andalusian influences, as you can see here, it's got Turkish also influences. Um, and this means that uh, it has a particular, it is a particular output of this specific architecture and urbanism. You can see here some more images of um, the, the sort of mixture of these um, different styles and influences. It's also an expression of Islamic philosophy in terms of housing and in terms of architecture. Um, so the typology of the houses of the Casbah is directly inspired from Islamic principles and uh, of intimacy, of sobriety. And this can actually inform a lot of the um, theories that are being developed today in Algeria in terms of housing um, for a sort of conservative society in a modern world. Now, authenticity and reconstruction. Why should we reconstruct? What does that mean in the case of the Casper of Algiers? Well, first of all, there are structural needs. Um, the way Islamic cities were built in the Middle Ages uh, portrays not only um, Islamic principles, but this is also true in terms of how the houses are actually standing. The houses are contiguous to each other, as you can see, and this uh, 3D reconstruction, exerting opposed forces that maintain them like believers are supposed to support each other in a society. Because of this structural particularity, if one house falls or is destroyed or partially damaged even, the house that is stuck to it will eventually start drifting and will crumble at some point. So it's really a continuous process of decay that if it isn't actively stopped, will continue until all the houses have finally fallen. So it's very much um, a structural need that uh, bolsters that. There's also the notion of feasibility. So we know through the different recordings, both local during the Ottoman period um, or the colonial period as well, very exactly to a certain extent what Algiers looked like um, originally in 1830. So it wouldn't be a work of guessing but rather working with the evidence. Um, so plants and uh, elevations and cadastres um, to rebuild what would be uh, built if such destruction didn't take place, which is here again, a guarantee of authenticity because we know of the materials that were used. We know what the houses looked like um, and it's not crafting a new heritage. That is that pre 1830s buildings would be built around tourist resorts or pretended to be historic when they're not, but it's rather to restore a necessary previous state of a specific heritage so that when people experience it today, they would get the same experiences that um, people had when they were living here before um, that decay took place. There's also the notion of stopping the physical and urban harm. So having and carrying out a reconstruction plan would also bring a stop to the ongoing harm that's been done to the Casper. And we can't see here because I couldn't get a photo of it, but there have been certainly sp empty spaces that were used as car parks inside of what used to be the, the city walls. And that can only really bring uh, more damage to um, the historic site. And finally, well, the notion of authenticity, how can reconstruction 
bring authenticity to Algiers Casper? Well, the reconstruction would ensure that the very reason why Algiers Casper is a historic site that is deemed of enough importance to become part of the shared world heritage uh, resides in a number of aspects, among which is particular architectural and urban characters, which have been partially damaged now that decay has been slowly but surely progressing through the years. Um, if this particular uh, case of the Caspa, um, if if that if the Caspa was to be uh, to undergo um, severe damage or even uh, destruction, total or enough destruction, then what would be really left of its authenticity, except for a few buildings or a few mon monuments that would have been preserved? Um, it would logically lose its importance and therefore the sta its status as a world heritage site. Um, the reconstructing houses and those ensuring that these elements of narrow streets and amalgamated townscape, as you can see on that uh, old photo, significant population density and a mix of human activities are all what makes the Caspa worth listing. Um, and in this case, reconstruction would offer a retrieval of a partially lost authenticity through the last couples of centuries, um, of, as we have seen. Especially since, after all, the Casper has been built as a result of a long and layered process, and that nothing says that it should be, in a sense, frozen in a point of um, its history. So this being more of a sort of French approach to, co to, to conservation, which is very much different from um, the Islamic take on that, um, as we can see, as we can see here. So, to conclude, really, I would say that in the case of the Caspa of, Al of Algiers, reconstruction can be a solution for its preservation, first of all, in order to stop the decay that it's in a lot of its a lot of places um, suffering from. Uh, but it's also make what makes it worth listing as a World Heritage Site. So there's its history or its urban and architectonic particularities and its vitality, really making it a spectacular example of, of the Medinas in the Islamic Mediterranean world. Also, the differences of valuation of heritage between Islamic conservation and Western conservation allow for another perspective on Algiers Caspa's heritage value. But reconstruction would also take several boxes in the Western conservation philosophy. Is the restoration to a previous state in order to restore the experiences that people would have had in that particular heritage site would actually restore authenticity, even if uh, this requires a reconstruction of um, a lost heritage. And here are my, co my contact information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Mayor, stop sharing my screen. Um, I think we can go now. Have access to share screen and everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you so much, Samir. Thank you. Hello, Shola. If you if you if you wish, I will go ahead and I will introduce our next speaker. Please Maya, go ahead. Are you able to share screen? Yes, sure. Okay. Now Great. I think so. Um, Maya, I don't have your biography, but I've known Maya for for many years. Uh, Maya um, uh, teaches uh, architectural conservation in Rome. She's uh, presently uh, visiting Mexico City. Um, Maya is the only, um, she's the only person from Mexico that I know that when she speaks English, she speaks with an Italian accent, which I find very intriguing. And, um, and Maya, is, uh, Maya is former vice president of Escarsa, and now she's the editor of the Escarsa newsletter. So Maya, please, um, please feel free to to start your presentation. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Shola. Uh, well, my presentation, I have prepared this presentation by making a parallel with the restoration of works of art, because I'm convinced that today many misunderstandings in architectural restoration derive, at least in Italy, precisely from having translated the criteria for pictorial restoration directly to architectural restoration. So I share my screen. So I call my presentation eight points on authenticity or well the parallel between the restoration of the works of art and the restoration in architecture. And the first thing is that I have asked myself, what does authenticity mean today? Um, well, the vocabulary, uh, the, according to the English vocabulary, authenticity is a quality of being authentic. But there are many uh, synonyms which describe the features of uh, that authenticity, authentic being. Um, the let me, okay, the layers of history. In the Western tradition, men and nations have in, inherited different objects from their ancestors, sometimes with material value, precious, other enriched by memories, symbolic meanings, religious or political or artistic ideals. They kept and used these objects, preserving them as they, were, as they were received or adapting them to new uses or even changing them to build new ones. Through these processes, the objects accumulated and retained the signs, actions and intentions of the different generations who owned them. The interpretation of these signs today is not unique because they reflect in some cases simply utilitarian or emotional motivations and in other cases, cultural, artistic or symbolic reasons. The stratifications of these signs describe the historical process that these works have undergone through the time. The value of uh, the sacred relic. Since antiquity, there was a need to preserve special objects in an almost fetishistic manner linked to the cult of relics. Their value lay precisely in the preservation of their integrity and above all, their authenticity. Objects exist and therefore have value only if their material is authentic. Sacred images are the most significant example of this vision, completely different from other cultures whose cyclical conception of time admits and encourages the constant uh, renewal of the objects. From the Renaissance onward, the value of authenticity shifted to the authorship of the work of art at at a time when the emancipation of the artists achieved universal recognition. Let's think about Michelangelo, for instance. The recognition of artistic value, um, as the, those artists learn and emulated the language of the arts of antiquity, the architects of the Renaissance and the artists of the Renaissance satisfied two requirements, the acquisition of models for the work and the ability to please clients, creating works similar to those of Roman antiquity. Their ambition was to match, if not exceed, the grandeur of the ancient artists in the creation of new works. This behavior would continue until the 17th century with a stylistic completion in which the main objective was to achieve a harmony with the ancient work without attempting differentiation. 
During the mid 18th century, a more major awareness appeared in the restoration of works of art. The sculptor Bartolomeo Cavaceppi uh, insisted on not to rebuild a statue from a nose. The attention to ancient and thus authentic relics was gaining importance. Through the 19th century, architectural restoration would be marked by two opposite, uh, opposite, opposing positions that would significantly influence the conservation and restoration of works of art. One approach aimed to complete buildings in ruins or partially damaged in the historic style. The other that railed against the restoration works, attitude that clearly favored the conservation of the authentic text with all the signs of its aging, the traces of the passage of time and the patina that gives these works a dignity worthy of being preserved. Parasitical sublimity that was, theorized, uh, that was written by John Ruskin was considered as the highest value that a building can acquire over the centuries. The attention to the authenticity of the work of art and consequently the removal of false stylistic additions to clearly highlight the original parts was taken to its most extreme level in the last years of the 19th century with the spread of the ideas underlying the philological approach to restoration. It was at this time that the lacuna became mandatory and to be fully revealed using different materials or, or, or contrasting colors. While in medieval churches, substantial demolitions were made to altars and baroque structures in the search for a pure ancient style that in fact had never existed. Cesare Brandi's theory of re uh, restoration was published by the first time in 1963. Brandi introduced several topics that would establish the basic principle for the restoration of works of art and that hold true to this day. On the one hand, the concept of historic and artistic instance together with the theme of recognizability and at the same time, the harmonization of interventions using different materials and code with codes with particular attention for patina and the reversibility of any work of restoration. If we accept that architecture is the result of a long lasting process if we accept that architecture is authentic as an expression of that long a process, we will also have to accept that it is also a collective product in which many men have participated through the centuries. This means that architecture is not an autograph product as a painting by Raffaello could be. And this observation removes that sacred aura that surround the reliefs and the autographed works of art. Authenticity then shifts to a broader sphere which concerns the community that surrounds the building, the workers capable of carrying out certain jobs, but also traditions, customs, and uses related to that building. Therefore, the reconstruction which has often been considered a falsification of the building becomes authentic if it is a genuine expression of the will of the society and or the community to which the building belongs. And this calls into question many precepts that have dominated the second half of the 20th century, but we can discuss it, it the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, do we have a uh, Toki, Dr. Toki Lauton Brown? But I think she doesn't have access to share her screen okay. yet. I I can I can share her presentation. Oh, okay. okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I can. 
Can I share my video? Because it's telling me that the host has disabled it. Oh, okay. Let me look at that. Steve, can you yes. please help with that? Okay. Yes, Thanks. I can. I can, um, let's see, full screen. I'm going, uh, Toki, I'm going to share my screen and you're just going to have to tell me to move forward. Okay. If that's okay no with problem. you. Okay, let's see. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to see, I still can't sh um, share a video of myself. So, all right. Yeah, I just I'm gonna try to, to sort that out. But all right. let me just read out your bio before you start. Okay. That's okay. okay. Thank, okay. thank you. Um, Dr. Tuki Lauter Brown has worked as a heritage architect and cultural economist with Merging Ecologies. 12 years professional experience in conservation area character appraisals and management strategies conservation management plans, cultural landscape characterizations, assessments, world heritage nomination doses, restorations around across the globe. An executive member of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies, expert member of the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes, ECOMOS IFLA, uh, published articles on cultural heritage and marginalized heritage, Doctor of Science in Economics and Techniques for the Conservation of the Architectural and Environmental Heritage, University of Nova Gorica and Universita Luav di Venezia, Italy. I hope I got that correctly. <laughs> so the University of Venice. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. But it's, it's good to stay authentic and speak Italian instead of anglicizing it. So how, how, over to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone from New York. Um, in case you hear any noise, I'm on site. So please bear with me. And my apologies again for coming in late. I've sort of mixed up the time. I didn't realize it was CET. Uh, I thought it was West African time. So again, I'm, I'm my apologies. Great to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Lauten Brown and I will be talking on authenticity so where is Africa's convention in all of this? Because uh, we'll go through the whole list and I'm sort of trying to see, find where we can get Africa to actually define what authenticity means for them as opposed to getting um, um, the notion of authenticity from a Western um, perspective. Um, Stephen, you can go to the next slide. So from at the beginning, we had the League of Nations. So we had um, Kant talk about perpetual peace in 1795. We had the uh, Union in 1889. We had Powers 1914 and then the proposal in 1918. So then we went on to have the P uh, Paris Peace Conference in January 1919 and then the League of Nations in June, 1919. So all of this was talking about, you know, the um, need to come together to talk about our, um, uh, okay, sorry, my brain is gone off now. Talk about all of, all of this in principle and the secretariat was established in London. To the next slide, please. Then we went on again to, um, to the founding members who came together talking about landscapes, cultural landscapes, um, the definitions of landscapes, and all of this took place in different parts of Europe. Next, um, next slide, please. Then we have the international organizations, UNESCO, ICROM, ICOMOS, IUCN, the Council of Europe, International Council of Museums. Again, all 
taking place in Europe. Next slide, please. And then the World Heritage was birthed. So we have the, um, the OUV, we have authenticity, integrity, protection, management, the desired state of conservation. And then we have the conventions itself, the operational guidelines, tentative list, World Heritage list requirements, World Heritage committees, World Heritage Center advisory bodies. And all, all of this were birthed you know, in other places, other, and then we don't, we don't see more of um, Africans, you know, taking part in any of these births. And so the question of authenticity for me becomes very conflicting because now we're taking in all the definitions of OUVs, authenticity, integrities, which doesn't actually suit the African perspective. And so my question now goes to the sort of issues we are finding regarding outstanding universal value. I know it's really important, but can we see it from a perspective of our universe, um, universal value as opposed to outstanding universal value? Because when we focus on things like this, it becomes a, an intergovernmental definition right? And it doesn't come from the community. But if we look at it from our universal value, then we see it as something, we see every potential in every property that needs to be listed or needs to follow the guidelines, right? And for an African perspective, we end up, we end up inventing an outstanding value, um, an outstanding universal value on a property because we think it suits the Western ideology, as opposed to actually taking care or being sustainable with our properties as we have done for eons and working with the environment. Because when it comes to the circle of, um, of, of these properties, it follows a certain pattern. Somebody builds, a father builds, he dies, his, his building follows him, it dies with him. So there's a circle of life that follows it. What we, pro we try to keep are the skills of, those, of that building heritage. The next slide, please. And so when we talk about the heritage value, so we're considering the parts of the cultural and natural heritage, which are outstanding interests and therefore need to be preserved as part of the world heritage of mankind as whole. Whose nostalgia are we considering? How sustainable are these properties in the long term? Because we also need to think about, about the economic values in the future, right? And can we afford to keep all these properties? Because we're also talking about climate change. Could we, next slide please. So again, outstanding universal value, our universal value, should it always come from a governmental uh, position or can we now start to include the community as the proper custodians of their properties? And that gives us the sustainability that it deserves. I'm much more radical when it comes to things like this because I just feel that every region should be able to determine their own universal value, their own authenticity, their own integrity. And this is why I'm asking the question, where is Africa's conventions? Where is Africa's guiding principles? When are indigenous people going to have conventions which state their own um, universal values, which state their own methods of integrity, which states their own methods of authenticity? Because again, we're talking about much more than just the monuments. We're talking about the spiritual essence. We're talking about generations and um, um, generations of stories that have been passed down from fathers, mothers to their children and how this impacts on these uh, properties. Next um, slide, please. 
So we all know the statement of, of outstanding universal value. I just put that in there because of all that goes with it when it's being inscribed, the assessments of the conditions of which is integrity, authenticity. I know that the last speakers, you know, touched on different buildings and talked about the authenticity of these buildings in regards to the skill sets, to the um, to this um, to the extensions of keeping them over years, right? Maintenance and management and all of that, but from a society where we think of a life circle, how do we justify the statement of outstanding universal value? Next slide, please. And so I decided to put in how the evaluation process goes, you know, through all the stages. And so we hear things like, oh, Africa has no architecture or Africa has no, um, and then it's more of our natural, uh, cultural landscapes that are being listed as, uh, because it, it, it imbibes the whole um, authenticity because it's natural, right? But we forget that people live within this landscape. And so it's a living landscape. And the moment it's put on a list and people are displaced, it's no longer considered their heritage because they've moved that whole essence of it. They just take maybe, um, the soil or the stones, and they move somewhere else. And for as long as we can't um, have that connection to source, you lose the authenticity of what made that place the place it is to be listed in the first place. Next slide, please. So the integrity, I'm going to talk about the um, Osho Osho book growth um, in the next um, slide, but then integrity, social functional integrity, the historical structural integrity and the visual integrity. And so I'm going to walk through all of that with the Oshobo growth. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm rushing through, through all this. Oh, sorry, no, that's, okay. So from Venice to Nara. So we've, we've traveled from Venice to Nara. We've had all our definitions. We've had all our concepts of authenticity. We've adopted all of this. And then the, the issue is, we are not frozen in time because for Africans it's more of an evolution. And there's now a hybrid that is associated with our sites now because we have been influenced by the West and we've taken all of that on board. But we need to also understand that with this evolution, we lose parts of what we, we consider to be authentic, right? From Venice to Nara, right? We're not frozen in time. Next slide, please. So it shouldn't be exclusively about places, rather about the people, the cultures living within their collective traditions. And I think that's also what makes it authentic for the community and not the monuments themselves. Next slide. So I will start with Oshobo Grove. So, Oshobo Grove in, is in the Yoruba land and its status as the UNESCO World Heritage Site reflects this hidden subtext of authenticity. So um, Susan Wegner went in there with the community and they revived all the uh, sculptures and they reconfigured what was a result of a reappropriation, right? If I can call it that, of the objects that led to the dispute over their authenticity. So there was no master plan. They just went with it, they flowed with it. For the reappropriation was, it was never cited again, a lot of resource for architecture, right? So people go in there, there's festivals and all of that, you know, happens there till today. And the community on the, hand, on the other hand accomplished the re-authentication of this site, right? So the groove image works by turning what was once an expression of heritage through sensory, um, through sensory expressions, right? And the deification of this, of this heritage. So the importance of this is what makes it authentic for the community. And it's not the site because there are still um, groves across Yoruba land. 
And so the built environment is the very heart of the identity of this community. And it reflects their lifestyle, their social organization, their artistic practices, and the architectural adaptation to this culture and religious factors as artifacts within the African environment. And for me, I think it's time that Africa begins its own guiding principles and, and makes this as a part of the international community. Next slide, please. So I decided to put different pictures of um, an evolved um, essence or shapes of Africa. And as we move towards the modern, um, the, mo the 21st century, we lose all of these patterns because of the influences that we have um, taken on board. And for us to be part of the international community, ethically, it means we need to be part of the conversation. It means we have to bring our perspectives to the table and bring our own ideas of what authenticity means to Africa in general. And this is where I end my slide. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Dr. Lau and Tom Brown. Um, I think we've run through the presenters we have. Uh, Steve, any luck with uh, these uh, slides at least? Well, I have, the, I have the slides, but I think that maybe we should just save them for the, for the, next, for the next webinar. And okay. hopefully, hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, I would like to, um, I was asked to make some closing remarks. By the way, um, there, is a, there is a question and answer box in the lower uh, part of your screen. And if you have any questions, we'll try to make it through the questions as much as we can. Um, uh, despite the fact that we had we had a lot of difficulties, and I you can't imagine the the, uh, the hoops I've been jumping through from my end here, trying to pay attention um, and taking care of everything. But I thought that the I thought that the presentations all four of them were amazing. Um, uh, the uh, presentation by uh, Hong Shi Chow. It seems that there is a there is an Asian model which is very similar to what we read in the Nara document, where um, where uh, craftsmanship is seen as a as an intangible heritage that is something that needs to be um, that needs to be um, used and celebrated, um, and, uh, and also with replication with um, uh, um, uh, Samir's presentation. Uh, Samira, I've actually been to the Casbah, and it was great to visit it again. It was here in 2007, and I know that in I know that in Algeria, because I was working in Oran at the time, and I know that there was a problem with uh, abandoned buildings that were collapsing all the time because the, because of water leakage, and there was a certain time of year when a lot of um, buildings were damaged, and I'm. Um, I think that I'm seeing that uh, 15 years later with some of your presentation, but um, the uh, the what what I would call the uh, the um, uh, Arabic um, uh, uh, pattern of urban settlement in these kasbahs is um, is really intriguing and offers offers uh, models that that we are not um, that we are not. Um, uh, used to in the in the um, in the European West, and um, and and uh, it makes all kinds of new challenges, and so it was really wonderful to hear about that. Um, Maya's presentation was something that's very familiar to Europeans because we were talking about the uh, we're talking about the European experience, but um, I really loved the fact fact that. Uh, that Dr. Toki was talking about, she asked the question, where is Africa's guiding principles for authenticity? And whose nostalgia are we celebrating? And those are really interesting questions. So what we have are 
four presentations with four distinct perspectives. And um, this is not the first time that I've been involved with these types of webinars on authenticity and reconstruction. You can invite any four or five or 10 people to come up and speak about authenticity and reconstruction, and you will get a different perspective. That's why we need to be talking about this particular topic and uh, because, um, because our understanding of authenticity and reconstruction is something that is going through an evolution. And because of, because of, because of war and political change, we have a lot of um, reconstruction going on in the past, in the past century. I, I mean, reconstruction is something that's been going on since time immemorial, but there are, there are reasons why we do reconstruction. Some of them uh, may be considered to be good, and some of them may be, uh, may be terrible. So uh, without any further ado, let's open up the question and answers. And um, hopefully, let's see, where can we start? I think that we have some questions for Hong Shi Chow from China. I can find them. Yeah, I think I saw the, the questions. Yes. So, okay, so I can quickly answer the question. Um, the question about um, how, uh, what's the props process of, to categorize the degree of value of the cultural heritage and uh, what's the key challenges uh, during the implementation. And uh, I would say that the Forbidden City it's not only a World Heritage Site, but also a National Register Monument. So our involvement have to follow China's principle of cultural heritage preservation, and which was uh, written and proposed through the collaboration between the China Administration of Cultural Heritage of the Ministry of Culture and the Sun International Organization, uh, including Getty Institute. And uh, we spent three years to work with the uh, Tsinghua University's architectural school. Uh, it's one of the top architectural program in the world. And with the Palace Museum's architectural heritage technology and the Imperial Code History Department to carry out um, comprehensive research and uh, propose a master plan to categorize the value of heritage uh, significance and in Chenlong Garden, we found the interior decorations applied the exceptional craftsmanship, uh, like the double-sided embroidery I just mentioned, and that normally only used on objects. So uh, the interiors, they are of the top level value. And this is one of the reasons that we separate the text by exterior and interiors component. And uh, I, I found the, the challenges um, in this project, it's really about how to build the decision-making mechanism. Um, it's a very good question because I would say carry out a conservation project sometimes is a dynamic process and unexpected issues might come out time by time. So from our experience at Channel Garden, we built a solution and decision-making mechanism through three levels. The first level is about the uh, international perspective, the cooperation and debate between the Palace Museum and WF, and both of them uh, exchange their value, uh, rationale, expectations, and application based on international and local cultural heritage regulation and documents. And the second level is about the um, international and local experts expertise, uh, perspective, sorry. This is what I, uh, what I just say, the pairing model, the concept. Each pair Chinese and foreign experts, uh, they work together to figure out best solutions of specific issue. And the final decision will be made at the milestone meetings uh, collectively. And the third level is around the communication between conservator at the Palace Museum and outside contractor and the Chenlong Garden Tax Force. The Tax Force uh, 
has to work on site and to monitor and sometimes to make judgment and to give a direct instruction based on the spirit of the principles and resolutions of the milestone meetings. Yeah, so I think that's my, my quick response to. Can I kind of ask a follow-up question there, Hongxi? Um, well, thank you very much for, for your answer. And I think for me personally, it kind of touches on, you know, Dr. Toki's uh, presentation, which kind of speaks for in Nigeria, West Africa, Africa in, in broad. But I think what I what really touched me in your answer, Hongxi, is how you had to, no matter how international your perspective was from the big and mighty, you know, world monuments on, you had to align with the national laws, the national um, guidelines. And you know, I just want to ask you how how much of a of a discrepancy you know, was there between what you were bringing from this international perspective and what you found locally, because I think it speaks to Dr. Turkey's comments about how, you know, you get lost in translation when, you know, whose, whose value system are you using? The local community or this World Heritage Committee who sends experts, yes, but it, it might be a slightly different view from the local community. So, uh, did you find any of those discrepancies in your work at the palace, Hongxi? You know, that's my question. And I don't know if Dr. Toki wants to add anything in terms of a response to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's uh, a little bit broad uh, question, and sometimes it's not. There's no easy answer to it. But I would say that WF's approach is clear that we always uh, to, to, to undertake our project with uh, local partners. Um, and one thing we bear in mind is that we did not come to get lessons. Uh, in developing our projects, we listen, we learn from each other and we approach each uh, project with respect for our partners, for the artists and architects and cultures that created the incredible places where we work. So I think it just takes time to build the mutual understanding and respect. And I think that's the first step. Okay, I, I think I can come in here. I'm just answering um, message, um, the questions on the q and A. I I think a lot of this is also knowing the areas that you're working in, understanding the people that you're working with, understanding even the subtle, you know, the subtle essences of where you're working. And I always say, start off ethically and be socially responsible when it comes to working on buildings that you're not used to their own heritage. I don't know how else to uh, put it, but understanding that this is a different region, if you're working in a place other than your own um, region, understand that it's a different region, understand that the people might think of the place or that area that you're working on or that heritage building that you're working on in a different way and try to sort of unlearn what you've learned and learn of the region. I don't know if that answers the um, question, but that would be my thinking. Hello? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So I, yes, oh, okay. it's, just, it's in line with, you know, and uh, uh, I wouldn't mind if somebody adds to that. Thank you. Yeah, I, Can we I think go to the next? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if, if I may, I just wanted to, I just wanted to comment on what Dr. Toki said. Um, I, I did have a project in Bhutan and I was working on a rammed earth uh, monastery complex where we saved the monastery, but we basically pulled down everything else. It was, you know, the, mon the uh, monk's quarters uh, because they were made out of rammed earth and wood. We pulled them down, made piles of the of the clay, and we re-added water and we re-rammed them and we used new wood and we built it back in the um, 
using the same technology that the original mm -hmm. things were built, not necessarily exactly the same, but using mm -hmm. all it was was all of this um, intangible heritage craftsmanship that Hong Chi was talking about. And I think that uh, I think that what we uh, came up with was something that was very authentic, even though we did make the courtyard between the buildings a little bit larger. We moved things around because we wanted to make sure that the building wasn't going to burn down, which is a real problem in the Himalayas with these types of structures. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, there are there are different uh, there are different approaches. You go to a different culture. There's a different approach, and you have to if uh, if you're uh, if you're the for, foreigner, the interloper, you need to learn to uh, be quiet and listen and understand just exactly what everybody else is expecting and not what your preconceived notions are. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I think that is quite true that uh, in Chenong Garden Project, there are many differences between the Chinese and the international uh, context resulting in different conservation ethics and uh, intervention approaches. But, uh, and Steve, you must be right that there's one thing in common that is uh, they both want to explore and conserve the traditional techniques that lie in the cultural heritage and want to pass it on to the future generations. Mm -hmm. And pass it on sustainably as well, because there's such a thing as something becoming too expensive and the future generation having to decide whether to keep it is also um, an issue. So yes, um, we all want to save something for the next generation, but will it be cost effective because I do know of um, um, heritage buildings in Italy that families owned, right? That they wanted to pass on this um, huge buildings that they wanted to pass on, but they couldn't afford to um, keep it. So they gave it to the government. So at whose expense and what exactly are we uh, conserving? And is it cost effective to do so, you know? But thinking in those terms, sorry, it's just the economic uh, background in me that keeps popping up. <laughs> I, I think there's another question that um, that uh, Professor Mario Santana has posed to us, and Mario is our is uh, the Secretary General of ECOMOS. He rewrites: Is authenticity a concept we need to drop and substitute? given that it prevents to understand heritage as a dynamic constant in change phenomena. Does anybody want to take on that question? And also there's a, there's, this is being discussed in the chat group as well. Yes, um, that's a good question. Do we drop the word? Mm -hmm. So what do we call it instead? <laughs> you know, I, I think re, uh, regardless of what we drop or what we pick, we have to always remember that we evolve as well. So will the words evolve with us as we change perspectives, as we take on other perspectives? Is that the question we should be asking ourselves? <laughs> or did I just make it worse? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm I'm not sure that he's I'm not sure that he's talking about ditching the word authenticity. <laughs> he's talking about ditching ditching the concept of authenticity mm -hmm. and maybe we need a different concept which doesn't mean the same thing as what we understand mm -hmm. as authenticity in the united states we don't use the term authenticity we like to talk about integrity and there, there's mm -hmm. a there's a subtle difference there but there's a little bit of a difference so i know that everybody um but but um in the united states we are very much grounded in the european uh, traditions mm -hmm. of what is meant by authenticity and how do we do heritage conservation. So it would be great to hear from some of the other panelists on this question. Yeah, yeah before somebody else talks, uh, I just wanted to add that I think it will be a bit difficult for us who are from, will I say the, I don't know if I can say the global south, whatever that means, but I would say from Nigeria, from West Africa, um, you know, to replace the word authenticity with integrity, like the example you gave, would be a bit difficult for us because 
you know, my personal experience is that uh, what is called my architectural heritage, bulk of it that is easily accessible is actually colonial heritage. Mm. So, you know, you even find that, you know, the basis of understanding what is really my heritage is, is difficult or is non-existent. I have to look for books that are hard to find, look for pictures, look for, you know, hard, hard to reach places to get some information. And so, you know, have, with that in mind, I don't know what to say or how to say something has integrity because I don't know what integrity is, you know? So I think, you know, Did we lose Shola? Okay, well, so we, we lost we lost Shola again. So we're just um, if does that um, Samir, do you have anything that you want to add to this particular discussion? Yeah, yeah. Well, about authenticity, I think I think there is some potential uh, for dropping completely the the concept in terms of heritage because. I mean, we need to remember what heritage is to begin with. Uh, that's not that's not a very old concept. It's quite new, mm -hmm. and it's something that has sort of started to appear with nationalism. It was about telling the story of a nation, and then justify that groups of people would rally together into mm -hmm. a nation state. And so, there's this process of heritage fabrication, as it's called. And well, technically, every nation state is sort of fabricated every country is fabricated countries weren't there when, when the earth first existed so that's an invention that we needed to invent for ourselves and so there's in every nation state a bit of myth um so i think that also impacts heritage um what makes something heritage is just that a group of people agree and say well this is our heritage and we will rally around that as a group of people so i think it might not be universal agreement on that, but there is some potential. I can see some potential for, in some conservation philosophies or thing thought, to to drop this concept almost entirely. There is potential for that. I think. Okay. Um, Maya, would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, I was uh, reflecting on what has been said, and um, well, of course, um, the, the the particular case of Italy that I tried to show, that is, uh, of course, the is central in the debate on the uh, restoration mm -hmm. and conservation of heritage in Italy, uh, doesn't have much to do with the rest of the world because they had the Cesare Brandi that has been something like the Bible for the restoration works, uh, not only for picture, uh, for, for painting or for works of art, but uh, for everything. And, uh, but now I think it's time to, um, well, to wide all the, the, the idea of uh, intervention because Cesare Brandi was um, thought uh, for only the restoration of mural painting. But the problem is that uh, all the translations of the, well, I think is the most translated uh, book in the world <laughs> about conservation it has been translated to all the languages. And in many, many countries that has arrived a little bit late, uh, the people is taking the Cesare Brandi theory as the, really the Bible. and. Uh, well, I'm trying always to say that, okay, this is not good for architecture. This is not good. And for other contexts, he, he, he worked a lot in the restoration of frescoes and mural painting that was damaged after the war, the Second World War. And that's, um, that was his laboratory where he, exp he experimented uh, all the, 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 his, the theory. And, and then the theory, in fact, was not a book published by him, but it was the result of his lessons that were taken by their pupils that published in 1963. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that this um, 
general misunderstanding on that, but uh, uh, what I try to, to show is that uh, architectural restoration has almost nothing to do. With. Of course, we can take all the experience and all that process that I tried to show, the reliques, and then the, 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 the intention of the Renaissance architects. I, I, I use the sculptures because Bernini was perfect to show that uh, uh, integrity of uh, the, the, the mm -hmm. sculptures of Montorsoli and Bernini in the Renaissance and in the Baroque. But of course, all these processes has a deal especially with the works of uh, art. And uh, for the architectural restoration, it's only from the beginning of the 19th, the 19th century that mm -hmm. we can start trying uh, to, uh, we can start speaking about it. But uh, we shall also try to uh, go out from the two um, radical positions on absolute conservation and reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, every case is a single case. <laughs> it relates to the people, to the use, to the meaning of that building in the history of that place. So it is not uh, easy to give a receipt and say, this is good. What is good for one place is not good for the other place. So. That's uh, what I wanted to, to highlight in my presentation. I think uh, it, it was clear. <clears throat> there is an interesting uh, question that was, uh, that was posed and I think you partly answered it. The question is, do you consider that reconstruction for a severely damaged heritage building is a wise option as a re authentic Reauthentication measure, and um, and I think that I think that part of your answer was it depends, and it really does depend because um, I've I've done a significant amount of work in the former Soviet states and in Eastern Europe, and there's been a regime change, and um, uh, there has been a resurgence in in religion. Um, you know, they have, they have, uh, they have Christian, Islamic, and uh, Buddhist religions there, and um, and many uh, many religious structures that were completely destroyed or were greatly altered are being um, uh, reconstructed or repurposed for re religious ceremony again, which is something that's very interesting to see. Uh, yes, why don't you go ahead, uh, Maria? Yes, no, I, regarding what you are saying in this moment, I was thinking about the Frauenkirche in Dresden, that I think is the most important uh, and most interesting case of reconstruction because uh, they have really, really followed the same constructive process. They have started all the history of the building. They had the, they were lucky because they had all the documents, uh, the historic documents that uh, spoke and uh, described the uh, construction at the beginning of the 18th century. So I think that was a very interesting case because also the structure and the methods of constructions were the uh, original ones, or they try at least uh, to use the, the same technique, uh, the, the construction technique. So this, I think that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. In other cases, I'm not so convinced when the structure is in uh, concrete, reinforced concrete, and then all the, the covering in stone is made for some churches that have been rebuilt. But, uh, well, we can also discuss it in another seminar. Any of our other panelists want to um, address the topic about whether um, uh, reconstruction is a, is a wise option for re-authentication? I think it depends who you ask. Uh, if you ask, um, John Ruskin, who would say no, um, but again, as you said, I mean, it depends on the perspective that people have on that specific type of heritage. Um, if we want to be 
sort of community led if we want to let people decide what their heritage is and if they decide to rebuild and to attribute mm-hmm. value to that rebuilt heritage i think it's ethically what we should uh, go with um but uh, again it will depend on who decides what heritage is and who decides that what what, what how what's their relationship to authenticity how do they define it and whether <clears throat> they consider it's relevant at all in the valuation conservation process of heritage. I know that there's been a debate in Nigeria. Um, well, we had this debate on um, e-commerce Nigeria where we were talking about um, if we were to conserve um, colonial buildings um, in places like Lagos. And a lot of people were like, they didn't want that to be um, conserved because of the trauma from it. And some people were of the opinion that it was their resources that were used for the buildings in the first place. So they would prefer to conserve the building. And then, um, and so this, um, there was a big divide on, on you know, the two aspects of what they wanted to do with buildings like this. And the suggestion is, Yes, you keep the buildings because it is the people's resources that went into it, but you can readapt it and still um, and still put attributes, you know, African ar- attributes on the building during, you know, during restoration. So can we consider that as authentic now? Since we're having a shared build um, heritage in the, con- uh, in the reconstruction, what do you guys think? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it might be, uh, it has been experiences of that. I know that in Indonesia, they, they had a, a project um, which involved the Dutch to reconstruct some, some key colonial buildings and monuments. Um, but it, it should be part of a bigger process of history writing, which is very delicate because you've got two very different perspectives on that shared history. Um, you want to be optimistic, maybe. Uh, if you want to be pessimistic, you'd say, no, that, that's never going to happen. Um, and so again, it depends on, and it's a case by case thing because Indonesia with the Netherlands yes. is not Nigeria with the UK and it's not Algeria with France. Very different mm-hmm. uh, cases of colonization or occupation. Or, so, yeah. That's good. <laughs> I decided yeah. to throw the spanner into the work there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to I'm going to um, go on to the next I'm going on to the next question. <clears throat> I was wondering how restoration architects would go about restoring a building which does not have proper documentation on how it was built. Some of the speakers had mentioned that understanding the methods in which building has been produced is important to authenticity. Would architects be able to restore a building while still remaining still remaining authenticity in this case? Whose criteria are we following? Okay, well, um, my, my answer to this would be that, um, is it... Uh, Yes, you do have to have proper documentation. You have to understand how a building is a building or a site is uh, is put together if you're going to intervene on it. If you don't, if you don't have a basic understanding and you intervene, then you're probably um, is, then I I would probably consider that criminal. Maya, pardon me. No, I was uh, reading the the question. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat, please? Okay, well, I, I think we're talking about whether it's important, whether or not it's important to have proper documentation about um, the original construction of a building if you're going to, if you're going to determine its authenticity and then you're going to intervene. Yes, well, um, well, I think that the cases are uh, always different. I mean, if uh, you are in uh, some countries maybe the documentation could be really the, a good uh, um, starting point 
But then maybe if you don't have a documentation, but you have tradition, mm, yes. this is the point because the tradition has not been interrupted. In European countries, traditions have been interrupted in many places. So of course, if you want to act on uh, a reconstruction, you have to deal with the historical uh, documentation. Otherwise you are inventing what uh, you are reconstructing. But uh, what, if you are talking, I, I'm thinking about Mexico and uh, you have many, many places in Mexico where tradition is still alive and people knows what they have to do. So you don't need the historical documentation because it is a process that is mm -hmm. still going on. The, I, I mean, the, the, the problem is when you don't have a process uh, that is continuing, that has been interrupted. So then the, the problem of reconstruction uh, deals with other questions that uh, theoretical and historical questions. But I think it's a question of tradition also, tradition and the, the continuity of the process. And it, 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 again, it also depends on the region and coming from a Nigerian perspective, a lot of the issues is, yes, there is documentation on some properties, you know, that you can work on for reconstruction. And then some community um, members do not want the reconstruction to look like the um, like those properties of before because they say it's primitive, they want something more modern. So again, what do you do as an architect? Because you have to weigh all of these options and all of these issues that come with properties where people actually want to move on from the uh, perception of what their traditional architecture looked like. Yes, well, of course, it has been the same process everywhere in the world. Of course, in the industrialized uh, um, countries, it happened maybe 100 years ago in Italy, in Southern Italy, people do, didn't like to live anymore in masonry uh, houses because they considered they were old and they needed to renew it and they have changed using uh, reinforced concrete and of course the results are uh, evident in uh, mm -hmm. during earthquakes because they mixed yes in, uh, not a good way the different materials but you know uh, I yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no, no. I've, I've, I've started to, I've started to look at this question of tradition in a different way. I was pulling together a presentation for my students last week, and I was talking to them about mortars. And really, uh, uh, as far as mortars go, there are four kinds of mortars that I, that I'm aware of that I've worked in: um, mm -hmm. lime, yes. clay, gypsum, mm -hmm. and Portland cement. Mm -hmm. which Portland cement is something that I've built my entire career around because I'm in the United States mm -hmm. and that's all we use. But if you think about it, um, the lime mortar is a tradition. Lime mortar is a tradition that, um, that is European based. Clay is a tradition, using clay mortars is a tradition that you see in parts of South Africa, South America, excuse me in Africa, in parts of Africa, and also in, up in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Gypsum is something that you see in the Middle East, mainly in Iran and in parts mm -hmm. of Iraq. But Portland cement is almost, I would call it like a post-industrial world tradition that's supplanting everything else. And people who use these other materials, they're starting to lose those um, they're just trying to lose those traditions because everybody is starting to use Portland cement now. It's like a post-traditional, um, I mean, post, um, post-industrial uh, tradition. I, I know that's, that's kind of a weird way to see it, but that's kind of the way I see it. Concrete kind of falls in the same thing as well. Concrete is starting to supplant everything. And um, because of the work I've done in Haiti, um, uh, concrete, reinforced concrete is a counterintuitive material and people need to follow manuals to build 
properly and reinforce concrete. But if you go into if you go into um, uh, developing countries where people still have this tradition that they build on their own and they see a reinforced concrete building going up and they go, oh, that's how they that's how they do it. They go and they collect their own reinforcing and they kind of put it up on their own, and then an earthquake comes and they die. And so uh, these are these are really interesting questions about tradition. I'm, I, I will I will be quiet now. Uh, Professor Aron, do you have something that you want to add to this discussion? You need to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, the discussion is very interesting. I, I really enjoy following it. Okay. Okay. So maybe I can quickly uh, provide, if I may, provide another perspective related to wood, the material. So as I just mentioned, for seven years, the ancient Chinese have used wood to build timber structures. So they had de developed a comprehensive system of interventions that craftsmen still use today. And one of the advantage of following the traditional intervention method is that the, the intangible heritage such as craftsmanship, the community and the knowledge are preserved and the interventions done in different times uh, will make the wooden building just like the biography of itself. Okay, any other comments? If not, I'm going to, I'm going to pose the last question and we can debate the last question. And that is, uh, uh, this, this is the question. I have a question for everyone. How to establish the limits of an intervention in terms of authenticity in a cultural heritage site with components from different periods? What role does the opinion of society play in establishing this limit of authenticity? This is, this is better that I not uh, respond to this because in my country, uh, much of our heritage is not that old and we don't have these layers. We don't have, the, we don't have as much as a palimpsest of heritage that uh, we do in some countries that have older heritage. So I'll just, I will let the panelists uh, discuss this topic. Um, just I'm here to listen mostly, but I'll just like to leave my own comments and listen to my expert and professors who are going to speak. But I personally am facing that on a current project now. And I'm still, you know, in this problem, so I'd love to hear. But for example, I'm working on a building that was built by, you know, the Afro-Brazilian craftsmen in Lagos Island, you know, the people who returned to Nigeria after this. Uh, slavery was abolished and they came back with skills and all of that and they built uh, with bond brick. But now I'm supposed to restore that same building and I just recently got some training, uh, the traditional techniques of laying bricks and ramming, you know, rammed earth, laterite and all of that. And I'm, I'm really, really exploring how I can, you know, restore that building but using you know, the older techniques. So I don't know if that's kind of a response to this question in a way, but it's like my own situation that's similar to that, where I'm trying to bring something um, from a previous past before that building into that building to kind of try to, well, I say, create a new narrative for that building and be able to say that, oh, uh, there was, you know, traditional techniques and methods in the restoration, at least, if not the original construction, but in the restoration of this new building. Um, yeah, so those are my comments. I'll pass on to Maya. I think you had your hand up. You can on me. Yes, um, no, just uh, um, uh, Steve asked about uh, those uh, multi-layer buildings, stratificated buildings. Of course, I live in a country where uh, buildings have been 
multi-layer during the centuries. So really, I think this is the best example. But I think that the authenticity uh, consists exactly in that process that has changed the buildings. We, we, are, we never think about, or we should never think about the original building, the Coliseum. I cannot imagine the Coliseum as it was at the, in the eight, uh, year 80 after Christ uh, when it was open to the public. But um, in all the process and all the layers of history that had been, um, well, that are um, stratified on the, on the building. So I think that uh, this is important to consider every time, all the transformations that have been um, added to the building. And this is part of, of course, of the authenticity that we today can recognize to that building, not the original one, because there is, very often there is always this misunderstanding that uh, we intend uh, authenticity as the original work. And it is not at all that in architecture. Maybe if you are talking about a painting by Raffaello, we can discuss it. But uh, uh, in architecture, it's completely different. I, I totally agree with you on that, because I do believe that as we evolve, we should date as well. So people are aware that this is what happened before. This is the process, this is the evolution, and this is how we got here. So and going back to Charles um, dialogue. Um, it's also looking at how the materials work together as well, like so you so as you restore, you can't put a, a foreign uh, material on it because it becomes corrosive, right? So you also need to understand those elements as you restore the building and also work with like for like, uh, you know, that works all the time. But when you work with something other than the material itself, then you have future problems after the restoration. So I think it's also um, important to understand those aspects during restoration. And it, it, what I usually say is have a feel of the building itself. Stop thinking, have a feel of the building, listen to the building and do what the building needs. Absolutely, absolutely. That's it. I need, I need hearing lessons then. <laughs> <laughs> And following, uh, uh, following up that idea, I also uh, want to reiterate the importance of uh, passing on the knowledge and techniques from generation to generation. And it's really important to, I mean, one, one specific, specific um, topic is about education. I want to add a little more details from our channel garden project. Uh, because Dublin have developed a master degree program at Tsinghua University. And uh, we designed this uh, program to meet international standards and to introduce Western scientific approach to conservation and to combine the knowledge with the long history of Chinese craftsmanship that ca characterize China's best work and architecture. So I think that education and uh, and to create a broader understanding of cultural diversity is really a key uh, for the future. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so if it's okay with everybody, I, I, um, I, we're going to bring this, uh, this to a close. This has been a, this has been a wonderful debate. Um, this is our fifth um, Escarsa webinar and this particular webinar has had a wonderful debate that was part of it. And I think that we should probably do this again. And so if there is anybody on this call who feels like they, who they would like to make a presentation, please contact us at iscarsa at gmail.com because we will be pulling together another webinar on the topic of authenticity and reconstruction. Thank you so much, everybody who joined thank us. You. And thank you for, we had wonderful, pres uh, wonderful presentations, lively discussion. Everybody in the panel took part in the discussion. Thank you very much. And everybody have a nice morning, afternoon, evening.